take your Bibles to Matthew chapter 17, and I'm going to give you a spiritual um, Bible illustration of kind of what we've been doing with this radical life, and then I'll, I'll pull you back to Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to do a couple more of the Beatitudes and I, I kind of joked with you guys the week before last that my, my outline is coming straight from Jesus. It's, he wrote my outline. This is, this is Bible. I'm not trying to be creative with my wording or anything like that. I, I just want to give what he was saying. And Jesus, the first week that we looked at, was talking about Jesus came as the Word. The Word was made flesh, and the Word was Jesus. Then Jesus identified himself with saying that I am light. And then he said, I am the light of men that gives life literally mean the darkness of this world. And Jesus said, I'm going to show you a life that when you step into the world, it shines, it's different, it's radical. That's what darkness and light is. It's radically different. Nobody turns on a light in the darkness and says, I can't tell the difference. It doesn't matter how dark it is. That light blinds, it, it, it shines, it illuminates, it changes and then he went through and he explained and he said, you are the light of the world. Jesus said, I leave behind the light of the world to shine through my people. He was transforming them. And I, I, this is a big deal for me because of the idea that, in, and I, when we were doing back to the book, the three sermons before this, uh, about how we get away from the book and all of a sudden we begin to do life our own way and we can get so distracted as a church that all of a sudden we're busy and we're doing things and we have programs. But if we don't get back to the book and say, what does God require or expect? What does a Christian look like? What should we be doing in our lives? It's the same thing as the driving illustration that I used. Man, we took driving, driver's ed and all that, you know, some of us 20, 25, 30, 40 years ago. And all of a sudden we make up our own rules you know, when the change lanes and not using turning signals and cutting people off and all these things that we do, and it's wrong. And you say, well, that's the way I drive. It does not matter. It's wrong. It's wrong. And then all of a sudden we get back to the book and we realize, wow, there are so many things that I started doing in my life that I thought was good. And it was wrong. Jesus sits them down and he says, I don't want you figuring out religion. I don't want you figuring out life. I, I want the, 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 the one that gave life sat down on the side of the hill to begin to pour into them this truth. But I wanted to illustrate why this is so important. Because in Matthew 17, and I, I touched on this last time I preached, and then I thought, man, I want to show this to you. And when they were come, Matthew 17, 14, when they were come to the multitude, they came unto him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed, and oftentimes he falls into a fire and oft into the water. Now you can imagine, just imagine this, when you have somebody, it's, it's your child, it is your baby, and as a parent, you're sitting there saying, he's got something wrong with him. And it is so wrong that every single time he, he, he stands up or whatever, he falls over and he falls into the fire. And, and I, I can't stand seeing my child injured this way. Would it bother you? It bother me? I, I get upset when my kids have a fever or something's wrong with them. And he's coming before Jesus with a situation he could not fix. Guys, this world is filled with problems that they cannot fix. They're like, I don't know how to reach my son, and I don't know how to get through to my spouse, and I can't figure this out. And he said, verse 16, and I brought him to your church program, and I brought him into that facility that you had, and I found the brochure and the logo that you had, and, and, I, and I knew that you had your slogan, and I knew that you had this. I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. I brought them there, and I found them because they were wearing T-shirts that says, hope can be found here. You guys know what I'm saying? It's, it's like they had, they had all the things. We're disciples. Are you disciples? Yes, we are disciples of Jesus. What is your problem? Come before us. Let, let, let's figure this out. They had that. But you know what the problem was? They went through the motions of, well, let's have a little prayer, and, oh, Lord, we come before you. And they, they went through the motions of this, but that, let me explain to you, and this is what I was sharing my heart with you guys, they were powerless. Going through the motions of church, 
religion, God, Sunday morning, Sunday night, life group, whatever, going through the motions does not make you have the light or give you the power of God. It doesn't. And sometimes when somebody would ask, like, what is the hope of the world? And we say church. And, and, and I, I think sometimes we're referencing this building or this facility, the programs, and it's not. Notice this. He said in verse 19, and the disciples, and then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if you have faith of a grain of mustard seed, She'll say unto the mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall be removed, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. It doesn't matter. You, you, you knew what God was saying. He said, put a situation in front of you and tell me that God is not able to change lives and break through the heroin addictions in Columbus, Ohio, and break through the depression that seems to be flooding over our youth and our, our, our young people and everybody. And the suicide rate that keeps climbing, we sit there and say, it's just a bad day and age, and it's just rough. And God said to him, he said, show me a mountain, and give me a believer that has the faith in his heart, and let him, the, the faith of the size of a mustard seed, and say, let it be moved. This is not name it and claim it and going out there, I declare in Jesus' name to give me a million dollar home and all that. And that, that's where the world gets off. It's, for, it's not for your glory, but for God's glory. And he said in verse 1, how be it, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. And we sit there and say, wow, we need a change. We need help. We need a breakthrough. We need this, we need that. And God looks at us and says, you know what, I've got a prayerless church, and, and, and the fasting is just denying self. We can't skip a meal. We are Americans. We struggle skipping dessert. We, we freak out with Dairy, Dairy Queen coupons come into the mail and our mind is already on planning out our trip. I mean, we are. It, it is, we're so consumed with self that the idea of fasting and praying was can you deny yourself long enough to put your attention on God and not your own physical needs. You look at that and say, that's crazy. That's no, it was radical living. This, this was throughout the Bible of fasting and praying, all these things that he was giving them. And I'm not done talking on these things. But the th this thing about it is, if, if I was to do a spiritual thing among us as a church, just right now, and say we're praying that God uses this drama to change lives and break down depression and da, 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 all this other stuff. And God comes in and says, I just have one question. Who's in here fasting and praying? Then go ahead and put up your signs and logos and you can get a crowd. But don't expect breakthrough and change. Because that comes through the power of God and not the programs of people. So I, I have this so heavy on my heart that I don't want to just get up and preach messages like this and say, look, it, it's possible. And God, I, I, the, Back to the roots of it, when Jesus was on the side of the mountain, he said, guys, come here and sit down. I need to teach you how to live life. So Matthew chapter 5 again, this is leading up to this. And, and we, we went through, and seeing the multitudes, he went up to a mountain. When he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And this verse was split into two parts. The blessed is happy or blessed or uh, satisfied. There's different terms used to explain this. Are the poor in spirit. And when I explain that jar of how we're filled with ourselves and we are increased with goods and have need of nothing and how God was explaining that blessed are those that begin their life Pour it out. I even played that song for you guys in the middle of our service about, Lord, clear the stage. Take, take, just take it out. Lord, I've cluttered my life. I'm so distracted. I, it's me and my agenda and my plans and my 401k and my future this and all this other stuff. Lord, just clear the stage. And that poor in spirit was talking about the inner man, the real you. 
And he said this promise, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The is, is present tense in the middle of this, talking about the presence of God or the kingdom of heaven will be there on earth. You talk about having an Easter Sunday where we give the gospel out and lives are changed. It's not because of Pastor Tony, but because of the power of God. Heaven on earth, the presence of everything that he is represented in a room on a Sunday morning. I want that. God says, you want that? It starts with blessed are the empty, poor, broken, humbled in spirits. So we get into two more today, and I'm going to touch on three. But we'll close because I just knew I just, it was going to take too much time, and I didn't want to rush through it. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. They that mourn, or in a sense that a practical aspect of this would be, I would use the word broken. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. This is an odd thing to say, and I think that's why sometimes we've got to stop and say, what does that mean? The context uh, of the traditions and their culture during that time, of what he was saying. Because sometimes we just read through stuff like this, and like, blessed are they that mourn. Anybody crying in here? Blessings are coming your way. And it sounds like a weird thing to say about happy are you if you're sad i mean in the context it almost looks like that blessed are you if you're sad and it's not meaning that there's different kinds of mourning in the bible one of them is the natural mourning jesus mourned jesus wept when lazarus passed away we've all gone through that it's a natural thing jesus would not come to us and say you are happy or blessed are you when you go through grief a lot you know then you'll be really happy it doesn't make sense Losing a loved one or going through a hardship in life wasn't, the, wasn't uh, the, the, the morning that Jesus was talking about. He was talking about a condition of the heart, so we know it wasn't that. There's sinful mourning, mourning over not getting your way. When your kids are, are upset and they throw themselves on the floor and they kick and, you know, and, and what they, they, they don't need to get their way in that situation. They, they, they need to be spanked in that situation. That's what this, they need to be an attitude adjustment in that situation. And all of a sudden, they're, they're, they're kicking and screaming and crying and doing all that. And, and it's the, the sinful morning. It's the same illustration of Ahab. You guys remember Ahab when he wanted Nabal's vineyard? And he went to his bed and he threw himself down in the bed and he started pouting and crying. That, that was sinful morning. It wasn't godly morning. It wasn't the right thing. He was upset. But then there's spiritual mourning, which is sorrow over sin or sorrow of brokenness in your heart. The word mourn is the strongest form in the, uh, uh, of it in the Greek. It, it means to mourn like if someone was to die. It's not just a passing feeling like, oh, Dairy Queen's closed and I really wanted a blizzard. It's not that kind of, it's not disappointment. But when the doctor comes in and says there's nothing else we can do and we're going to lose them. It's a reference of brokenness. This is, this is an inward change. It's a, it's, a, it's a desperate inward change that happens when someone is deeply inward, aware of their sin that brings real change. People will say things like, hey man, you should not have done that. And then we respond with, oh yeah, I guess, you're, you're right, man, I shouldn't have done that. Whoops, my bad. And you know, you, you should have been in church last Sunday. I know, and I, I'm working on it. And you know, all these you know, superficial things. Let me, let me explain it. That's not mourning. There, there's no brokenness involved in that. See, Jesus was not talking about feeling bad or Lord, I'm really sorry or Lord, please help me. Mourning is when our condition or direction is affected by our heart, the inner man. When I was a teenager, I had a really, really good relationship with my mom. I always did. And I know I've alluded to this story before, but it's truly what God laid on my heart. And I remember having this great relationship with my mom, and I, I don't know what's going on. When you're a teenager, you can, you can say dumb things. I remember saying dumb things as a teenager. My mom and dad worked like crazy to put us through a Christian school. They just felt that on their heart in their burden to do that, and, 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 and it cost them a lot. It, it put them through a lot to do that. As a result, there wasn't money for a lot of other things. Well, with teenagers, clothes was a big deal, and name brand shoes was a big deal. And, and I remember 
smarting off to my mom one time about, well, all the other kids have those clothes, and I guess, you know, we just can't have that. I, I, I remember what I said. I just remember saying a smart remark about, yeah, we can't even afford good clothes. And I remember my mom dropping her head and just weeping down the hallway into her bedroom, and she shut the door. She wasn't mad. She didn't scream. She didn't yell. And I remember my mom saying these words, I do my very best. And I tell you, I wish my mom would have just punched me in the gut. I wish she would have. Because I tell you, in that moment, there was something that happened in my life that was greater than any lesson that my mom could have verbally tried to get me. I saw my sin. I saw what I did I saw how it hurt her. And I promise you, sometimes we have it as, oh God, I'm sorry, I, but please forgive me. And God's saying, I don't want you to be sorry, I want you to repent. And sometimes we miss that confusion there of sitting there saying over and over again, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We're sorry. Saying sorry is regretting what you did and verbalizing that repenting is a change of direction. It's a change of direction. You're never going to change the inward direction of your life if you don't see and it doesn't affect you to the point of mourning where it grieves you to change. Like it did with my mom on that day when I realized what I had done, how I had hurt her. It's, I saw it for myself. I can say, and I'm not being cocky when I say this, I never said anything like that ever again to my mom. And I said other stupid things, lots of other stupid things, but not that. It changed me. See, what we need is not a lot of like going in the same direction, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's words, 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 but an inward change that turns us. That's what conviction does. It convinces me that I'm going in the wrong direction. Isaiah 55 verse 6 kind of explains this when he says, Seek ye the Lord while ye may be found, while he may be found. Call upon me while he is near. Listen to this. This is the description of this. Verse 7, let the wicked forsake his way. You guys, it doesn't say let the wicked stop there and say, sorry. You know, it's, it, it, let the wicked forsake. I was... I was a bad parent. I was unfaithful to God. I wasn't using my talents for God. I was doing all these things, and I forsook. I went the other direction. It affected me inwardly. The unrighteous man, his thoughts. This is the wrong way of thinking. I cannot stay on this path. Look at the next word. Let him return unto the Lord, that he may have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon Forsake, return, seek the Lord. 2 Timothy 2.19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. It's a change of direction. It's, it's not just saying words. But the promise that comes from this and, and, and uh, of this change of direction, and you've got to understand what Jesus was trying to do when he was calling out to them and he was saying, guys, if you do your own thing, you're never going to be able to follow and experience what God has over here. And I say that to every young person and every adult in here. If you're in the wrong direction and you've got bitterness in your heart or resentment or rebellion against parents or whatever, unless you change your direction, saying, Mom, I'm sorry, over and over again, is not going to change the result of where you're going. So we get into messes, and we lose our marriage, and we lose our kids, and all this other stuff. And God's saying, because the path that you're on, not just acknowledging that it's wrong, but acknowledging that you need to change, blessed are happy are those that mourn, that sit there and say, what am I doing? And changing your direction. The Bible says, they shall be comforted. The word comfort is pretty cool because I've taught on this a number of times, but in different contexts. In Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, it is talking about those that are called near to God or comforted or, or have a desire for something different, comforted. It's like when you get in trouble and all of a sudden you realize what you did is wrong and you go and embrace your father or mother. Comfort, you're called near, you're brought closer to God. God's saying you're never going to be closer to God when you're headed in the wrong 
direction. It changes you. Talking about darkness to light is radical different of direction in life, not, not just standing out being good, but headed in the right direction. You talk about how we make application to this. Psalms 139 verse 23, search me, O God, and know my heart. That's a deep prayer to go before. Because you know what, just like the first one, then we were talking about the humble. Uh, uh, blessed are those that are poor in spirit. You're never going to be mourning in your heart. You're never going to experience that when you're sitting there saying, I'm good. And, and that's a condition of a lot of us that we go through life. I'm okay. I'm good. You know, don't worry about it. It's like, you know, you, you, you want to pray with your spouse or in the invitation. Right? Honey, I'm fine. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. We're not good. We never lead to the brokenness in our life if we don't see our depravity or our emptiness. But this leads to something deeper because you have the humble or poured out or poor in spirit. You have those that, are, <clears throat> those that are broken and those that mourn to those that are meek. This is so cool. You know, it's amazing how we read through some of these things and we just breeze over them. But the meek is talking about the submitted, but I have to explain this for you guys to get this fully in the context that he was saying. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness is often equated or, or are assigned with, uh, with, with um, weakness. It's just the meek and mild. Often those go hand in hand. The meek meaning happy medium between two extremes. It's not weakness at all, but it's something that overpowers our pride. I love this study because Jesus was such a practical speaker. He was such a practical teacher. Meekness comes from the root Latin word, which literally means tamed by the hand. Okay, and I, I didn't fully understand this when I was doing this at first. Actually, it was one of those things that just threw me in a world that I could not get a grip on this. During their times, their, this would have registered with them big time because he was saying something that they understood. When I was a kid, real little, uh, me, Dave, and Denny would go to my grandma and grandpa's uh, farm. And they had a chicken farm, and they had all these pastures around, and they had all these cows, and no horses or anything like just all these cows. One day, somebody donated and gave to my grandpa and said, you have all these fields, would you take this pony from us because we can't do, we, we have no property or whatever for it. So, so my grandpa did it, put it out in the field, feed it, never rode it, never did anything to it, just let it go. So we're out there and we'd talk to grandpa all the time and said, go, let us go ride the pony. And he said, that pony's not like you see at the fair and stuff like that. That thing is vicious. It doesn't want you touching it. It doesn't want you anywhere around it. it it's not that type of um, thing. You cannot just go up and calm it down because you pet it. So we're out there one day, and I said, guys, I think we could actually ride that pony. <laughs> and all I knew is they had the string that they did this. You know, that's all I knew. And so we went and got a hay bale string. You guys know what I'm talking about? Just a string. And, and I threw it over the neck of this thing, which took forever for us to get there. <clears throat> and I remember us getting this bucket, and the, uh, we were debating, who's going to get on the pony first? And everybody said, it's just a pony. And I remember getting on it and then uh, jumping and grabbing that thing and going, go. And I, it just took off and it began to throw its back end up. And I remember going over this pony, landing on my face, busted my lip, busted my nose, getting up from that. It was not a good experience. <laughs> all those TV shows that they show about throwing their hat up and doing all that, none of that happened. All I had was a bloody face in that moment right there. This is the exact same illustration that God was saying from us. He was using the illustration or be tamed with the ham, was talking about the illustration of taming a wild horse. I've got a picture of this. So you've got to understand when they're out there, you've got to understand this horse is useless. It can't be rode. It can't be directed. It can't pull things. It can't help your family. It is the human nature of every single one of us in here. You get to tell it what to do or whatever, the rebellious spirit of it, it just rises up and does whatever it wants. I was at Kroger Thursday, Friday morning. Went to Kroger, I was buying groceries for the, the dinner we were having with the staff and I was in there and all of a sudden I was like halfway up an aisle and I hear screaming and yelling in Kroger. 
And of course, I'm like, what's this all about? So I, I walked up to the front. There was an irate customer standing there screaming, yelling, and cussing at this cashier. And just causing a fight, they took him back out, they took him back in eventually, thought he was calmed out. This poor old little old lady that was sitting there trying to ring up his groceries, he's sitting there beating his chest saying, you want to go right now? I'm thinking, are you serious? This dude is going to beat up this little old lady in the middle of this grocery store. And, and you say, how gross and how embarrassing and how, you're right, it was all of those things. But at the core of all of us, that is us. Now, it might be uh, not blowing up in the middle of Kroger, but I'm saying every one of us, and the reason why we have rebellion in us, even as teenagers, when our kids begin to get older and they become self-dependent, they're sitting there going, I don't have to listen to you. I'll do my own thing. I pay my own way. I'll go to my own place. the, the, The very aspect of all of us is the fact that we are not submitted. The very word submitted that this word is tied into literally means to place your yourself under the submission of the authority of someone else for the longest time we beat our chest i'm in charge i'll do my own thing that is why we have such a hard time with god when god says no i am your master and we sit back and say no i am my own master by the very thing that satan was kicked out of heaven for doing because of his pride and arrogance of raising himself up equal with god We'd sit there and say, I would not do that. We do that all the time. You realize that there's different aspects of submission that the Bible tells us about. It brings us to, blessed are the meek. That meek is to relinquish the range of your life. Take this example again, but change the picture. Same type of animal, but controlled by the reins of someone else. Tamed by the hand is what that meekness is. It is not an aspect of weakness. It's not weakness. Man, God has gifted us with passions and a mind to make money or a mind to build a business or a mind to parent or a mind to drive and do things in life. God is not sitting there saying, I want to relinquish you of everything that you are, but it's a matter of being tamed by the hand of God where you take the reins of your life and say, you now lead me. You control me. I'm yours. That meekness that he was talking about is literally God cannot use us in life. And we sit there and say, man, I've got talent. I do this and I built this. And God says, it does not matter. I cannot use you. Cannot use arrogance and pride when you're full of yourself. There's two aspects of this that he's talking about. We're talking about that meekness in our life. It's talking about submission or submitting to the word of God. You see, when that rider begins to tame with the hand, they bend, then begin to put themselves under the subjections of the words that they say or the guidance that they give. James, that talks about the tongue, said this very thing, Wherefore, laying apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness, listen to this, meekness, the tamed with the hand, or calmness of God's voice on us, the engrafted word, What God was saying, you're going to be useless in life if God cannot speak to you to guide you through life. But a lot of us, we're good with that until it's something that the preacher says that I just don't like that. And we all do it. You know what? Today's message was okay until he got on whatever. And I just just can't, I just don't like that. I didn't like how he said that or whatever. And sometimes if you hear a story about my mom or my cat or whatever, you can dislike that all day long. But if it comes from God's word, it's not up for debate. It's not. We will be a generation that fails in every aspect of our life if we cannot place ourselves under the submission of our God to listen to his word, to be calmed or tamed by what he says to us to be usable. That description of what I'm saying is meek and mild. It is controlled. It is power that is placed under the subjection of a higher power, which literally means you relinquish the control by giving Jesus or God the reins of your life. Teens will experience great things in their life when they realize that their parents are not out to get them or hate them. 
And God placed them there to guide them, to speak into their life so that they can be used for the glory of God. And we sit there and say that to teens all the time. But let me tell you, it is the same thing for adults. It's the same thing. God says some things in here, and I'm just going to warn you now, that are radical. Turn the other cheek. If thy, He says, what should you do with your enemies? Cut them off. Unfriend them on Facebook. God says, pray for them. Do good to them. Fight that battle on your knees. It goes against my flesh because my flesh wants to rise up and be like, I am not doing that if you only knew the half of it. And it's not right. It's not just submitting to his words that he says, but it's submitting to the leadership that he gives us. Because what that whole tame with the hand and them grabbing the reins of your life is submitting to the will of God because Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. You see, God's going to take us as a church on a journey if we're willing to stop going, this is what I want, this is what, and leads us, directs us. It's the same thing with every one of us in whatever aspect of your life is. In this Matthew 5, 5, the second part, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You say, our goal is not to become reigners of this earth, but during that time when Caesar was the leader, and they're sitting there saying, no, he is the master, he is the leader of this, God was explained to them that says, no, you will rise up as the influencers of this society. Not the world. Because as we begin to change us and we give the reins of our life to God and say, God, you've given me talents and abilities and money and direction and kids and family and all this stuff, but God, it's yours. Grab a hold of my life and you lead me and all of a sudden God begins to work through those things. This is what's going to happen in your life. You will begin to shine in the darkness and your influence will be greater than the darkness. It doesn't matter who the leadership is. It doesn't matter who's in political power. It doesn't matter what Hollywood is screaming. It doesn't matter what rap artists are pushing their messages. What will rise up greater than any of those will be the influence because it is God. Remember, heaven on earth that he was saying and the power of God working through us. He said, you will now be the influencers or inherit this earth. I wanted to go into the last one, but I won't. Because it is so rich. That the last one is talking about, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Not a matter of you getting up on Sunday morning and your wife saying, honey, we should go to church. I know, honey, it's just, no, we, we, we need to get up and we, we need to read our Bibles or we need to be involved and we, we need to do all this. Or, or, or I, I, you know you shouldn't be talking like, I know I shouldn't, but it's just a matter. I, I, we, we sit there and debate and argue and everything. When something happens when you relinquish your life to God and you give him the reins, something happens internally and you have a craving. We all know the principle of hunger and thirst very well, okay? All right, guys? Because you're sitting there right now going, we're going to be eating in the restaurant in about 30 minutes if he shuts up. Okay. And I get that. You get hungry. But there's something that happens of an internal desire for the things of God and nobody has to talk you into it. It's a hunger. It's a thirst. It's a craving. It's a desire. You say, I don't have that. I'll be honest, I, I don't have that. I've got to be prodded and pushed and pulled and my wife every Sunday has to be, oh, come on, honey, please go with me. Just this once. I, I know you're, you know, and it's just constantly. And if God is dragging you and your family is dragging you or you, you have to do that to your kids or whatever, there is a lack of hunger internally in your life. And I'm not going to ask you guys right now to sit there and say, God, make me hungry for the things of God. Wrong prayer. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You step back and you look at your house and life and say, Lord, I've made this about me. Lord, things are not right. And I know that. It's, it's not a matter. Don't jump the rings. Start at the beginning. Blessed are they that mourn. I'm not talking about us hurting my mom. Like in my story, I'm talking about us hurting our God. 
And I can say it all day long, but I'll tell you, when it affects your head and your heart, all of a sudden you step back going, wow, oh, oh man, I'm sorry, I can't, I'm not doing that anymore. You make a declaration to your wife, you're not begging me to go to church anymore, I'm going to do it because it's right. I'm going to change my direction, I'm going to change my heart, I'm going in a different way. And all of a sudden, in doing that, you take the reins of your life and you hand them to God and say, where are you taking me? What do you want to do with my life? Because it's yours. I take my hands off of it. And all that I am, you lead me, you speak to me, and you guide me. And all of a sudden, there's going to be a change in our life because when you're hungering and thirsting after righteousness, we don't have to say, will anybody fast in here today? Will anybody get on their knees? Will anybody pray? I need five people that will be willing to pray. No, when there's a hunger and I sit there and say there's a feast in the next room, everybody will go up and run to the feast when there's a hunger inside. There won't be space at our altars. There won't be space in our seats because there's a craving in our lives. And it continues. You say, wow, this makes sense. Yeah, Jesus made us. He made us different. It's, it's got to be his way or it doesn't work.